So, um, yeah, hi, thanks for the intro. I actually started specialising in social media in 2008 full time, which doesn't sound like that long ago, but actually that was before most people had Facebook. Um, so I'm kind of quite unusual in that respect. Um, and my background is that I used to run a small agency and then I sold it and then went to work for the RNLI. So really five, six, seven years of full time social media stuff. Um, I wouldn't call myself a guru, but thank you um, anyway. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, I thought I'd take it more from the angle of how do we gather content for social media, how do we use it and some of the trends that we see out there. Talking a little bit as well, following on from what Andy said about how we need to move away from just data. I think actually I can take it a step further because in my mind we've gone from data to sort of social being the big buzzy thing and I think it was a bit overhyped. For a while I was almost embarrassed to say that I worked in social media because I think it became such a buzzy phrase and such a kind of oh I work in social media when people didn't necessarily knew what that meant um, so I kind of tried to avoid the badge but at the same time I had to use that badge because that's how people identified with it and I think actually the next stage is not necessarily about stepping back from data but it's about personal data it's about that digital footprint that all of us have and so it's the combination of that big data and that social media to do really cleverly focused and directed campaigns so I'll come on to that um, a little bit more later on at the RNLI, we really use um, social media to do four main things. To inform the public about um, the work that we do. I'm sorry, I'm making the assumption that most of you know what the RNLI is. Um, we're lifeboats, we save lives at sea. Um, so we like to inform people about what we do. But also we have um, a coastal safety team, so education is an important part of what we do. So these, we have volunteers that go out to schools. We also have special interest groups. So we'll go and work with kayakers, for example, is one of the groups we're working with at the moment, where we identify from data sets of um, demand or perhaps ways where we think that there are um, better things that could be done to help save lives at sea. So preventative measures as well as um, rescue measures. Also, we want to support the volunteers that work for us. About 95% of the people who work for the RNLI are volunteers, um, which is a great tradition that we have and something that you know, we're very proud of. We do have staff, but we want to be able to support those people. So actually, it's just as important for us on a social media platform to support those volunteers, to say good luck, well done, for people that are fundraising for us. Everyone from um, you know, an individual person who collects for us right through to someone who perhaps does a big challenge. And also to raise funds. It's um, not our primary goal, but it's certainly something that we do do from social media. Personally, um, how do I use social media in my job? Someone asked me this about two weeks ago, um, which is quite nice timing because I was kind of thinking about putting it in here anyway. Um, certainly, I think part of what we do is to increase the reach of other campaigns, so to add on to print campaigns, door drops and things like that, as a part of, and very much we like to be there from the start. I also use it a lot to research what are other charities doing, what are my peers doing um, within the industry, or perhaps what are other organisations doing that aren't charities that I can take and rework to use in our own. I also like to use it to network. Um, I've been to a number of events where I've made connections with similar people in similar roles at charities, and I've definitely stayed in touch with them primarily through Twitter. And I'm finding now when I go to an event, I'll meet someone who says, oh yeah, I follow you on Twitter. And in fact, there'll sometimes be cases where I could tell you a lot about someone even though I've never actually met them because I've grown that network to an extent where I am sort of um, pulling stuff from there, I know them, but actually I haven't actually met them in, in person. And also tracking news and trends. One of the things that's become almost um, overwhelming, I suppose, for digital marketing at the moment, it's just the pace of change. Facebook has made some significant changes five times this year. We've gone from a point where at the start of the year, you couldn't use like or share this post as a competition to that now being allowed. We've gone from the point where you had to use an app to capture data to run a competition to the point where it's now what a lot of people were doing anyway. And it's been quite easy in the past to fall into traps when it's changed the other way of doing things incorrectly and having competitions closed down. I remember um, when I worked for myself, I had a client who, against my better judgment, set up their business as a Facebook person. Now, for those of you familiar with Facebook, that's very explicitly against the terms and conditions. And what happened was, um, two months before their large event, they actually had that profile shut down because they'd broken the terms of service. Now, there's not a lot you can do when that happens. So we always have this difficult challenge as marketers, and I'm sure um, the Dido guys have this as well, is that sometimes you have to give people advice when they can see other people breaking the rules, they can see people doing things a little bit differently, and actually, eventually, they do usually get caught out. 
So I think do listen to people and do stay on top of those news and trends and to monitor. One of the really important things we do with social media at the RNLI is find out what's going on about us, what people are saying about us. And actually sometimes we'll find a rescue out um, from Twitter before we've got the service return back, which is one of the things we use um, to gather information. I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges we have from social media. So I think some of them are unique to us, but some of them are general to all of you. Um, we have a very diverse range of audiences. We're using our social media channels. We, the main channels we use are Facebook and Twitter, but we do have a range of others. Um, we need to use it for volunteers. They want to see messages from us that back up the information they're giving out to people. Our staff are on social media. Increasingly, we're encouraging them to be ambassadors for the RNLI, so we have to give them the support and training that allows them to do that properly. Um, and also the general public, who some of whom are aware of us and some of whom aren't and don't support us already. We also have a quite unique challenge in that we're a 24-7 rescue service. So what do we do on Twitter? Do we expect someone to be monitoring that? And it's quite an unusual challenge. We have had two examples I can think of where people have tweeted at us around life-saving advice, as in, in terms of a rescue type capacity. Now I've been there a year and a half and that worries me slightly, but what we do have is we have a disclaimer on our main account that says we'll monitor this between 9 and 5, but we also have 24-hour press coverage, so we have out of hours, someone will keep an eye on those channels. They will look in on there every few hours to make sure that something's going on there. And I think the challenge from that is immediacy versus accuracy. Now, one of the um, challenges we often face is social media and a, a trend. If we take, for example, um, the Harlem Shake trend, which I'll come on to and talk a bit, bit more in detail, Something like that. If you jump on it too late, you're going to be seen as hopping onto the back of a bandwagon and it's kind of, it can view, be viewed very cynically and in a negative light. So we have this challenge constantly where we'll require content quite quickly for Facebook or for Twitter that we need to use and turn around very rapidly. But actually, it's also got to be on brand. It's got to be in the house style and it's got to accurately reflect what the RNLI does. And so there's a balance there that you always have to work on. There's also safeguarding. Um, we have a lot of our crew will interact with our local pages and um, we need to make sure that everyone that uses those pages and represents us is aware that we do have a young audience as well. We have Stormforce which is our junior membership um, and so we've got to make sure that all of those things are there if people are communicating on those challenges. So uh, quick question, how many stations, this is a map of all, all of our lifeboat stations, all the little dots you can see there are lifeboat stations. What percentage of those do you think have their own Facebook profile or Twitter account? 50%? Put your hand up. No? Less than that? Higher or lower? Higher. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go up with some 50, shall we? So 50%, who thinks it's 50 or more? 70% or more? 85% or more? 95%? There's only nine stations on there that don't have their own social media platform of some kind, either Facebook or Twitter. Now that presents quite a unique challenge for us as a team of two um, <laughs> in Paul. So I thought I'd probably bring that up as a quite a unique challenge, but also I think it'll give you some ideas on how we deal with that. I think um, I shamelessly stole some quite dramatic photos actually, so I'd like to say thanks to my um, colleague in the film and image department. But, for us, there's a real challenge that there can be anything, anyone, anytime, anywhere about any subject that can happen. And that's a big challenge. Don't underestimate that. There are, um, we rescue around 22 people a day. Now, we don't necessarily hear about all of those firsthand because those are local lifeboat stations rescuing um, local fishermen, for example, or whatever it might be. So the challenge for us is really how do we as an organisation, respond to all of that stuff when we, you know, we can't physically have people in all those places. And actually, that's our opportunity. Is that if we can get everyone to be a part of that collection machine, to be a part of gathering that content, to be sharing our stories, the challenge becomes our opportunity. Myself and my colleague Becky, we couldn't be on Facebook and Twitter 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, I could, but I wouldn't have much of a life left. Um, arguably. Uh, so I think we have to rely a lot on volunteers. Now it's become the trend recently to call it crowdsourcing, so I've shamelessly stolen that, but actually what we do is we have volunteer press officers who are associated with each lifeboat station and the way that they work is 
they will usually have access to that Facebook account for the local station as well as perhaps a crew member who works there. So what we're doing is we're trusting volunteers with our social media presence that's out there. Our main at RNLI Twitter account and our main facebook.com forward slash RNLI page, yeah, that's run centrally. But actually all of our regional pages are run by volunteers or crew members around the coast. Now that's quite a scary proposition. And if you're a business and you've got lots of shop staff, I think that's quite terrifying, that idea. I don't know um, what you guys would say to saying, hey, let's have some volunteers running our channels. But actually, it works really well. And we have to nurture that. Um, and, and that's really my role. I don't spend most of my time writing content or uh, you know, gathering stories and photos. Actually, what I do is spend most of my time nurturing the people who do. So it's about encouraging great content. It's about those local stories that are a bit quirky, making sure they know they can feed them back to us. You know, we have an inbox and we encourage people to share it. We like to get involved in the planning stage. Um, as soon as we can in a marketing campaign or any piece of activity that's going to have some sort of social media presence or, or, or content, we like to get involved as early as we can to make sure that it's, you know, it's formed in the right way. And also run quite a lot of training sessions. So we've recently run a series of lunchtime learning sessions and trained over 200 colleagues um, in the space of a week because we want them all to feel they can be ambassadors and that they can represent us. And you know what? Most people are quite smart. They can do it. You know, don't be scared. Um, we don't give them access to the main accounts because otherwise we'd have hundreds and thousands of messages posted every day and everyone would quickly run away scared um, and wouldn't follow us. We also have support groups. So one of the challenges we have is um, you don't have an RNLI email address if you're a volunteer necessarily. So how do we stay in touch with all of these people who look after all of our station pages? How do we stay in touch with all of these people who are volunteers that perhaps um, are education volunteers? So we have Facebook groups and we have email newsletters that we can reach out to them. And we're experimenting with Yammer at the moment as well, which is an internal social network um, from Microsoft, which was mentioned a little bit earlier this morning. But we also have clear guidelines for staff and volunteers. So we have two sets of um, handbooks, if you like, that we give to people. And they're not heavily legalese. They just say quite clearly, this is how we'd like you to behave. This is what we'd like you to do. Um, this is how we think you can encourage people to support the RNLI and how um, you can play your part in that. Something else that's new to me, actually, that I hadn't experienced before joining the RNLI is we love a huddle. So a huddle, um, not cuddle, by the way. Um, I said that somewhere once, and, and someone looked very confused at me. And when I asked them in the break, they said, do you have lots of cuddles? And I said, no, that's not quite what I meant. Um, so I thought I'd spell it out a bit more clearly. We have a morning news and issues huddle. So a group of us from the communications team, a colleague from marketing, a co colleague from publication, um, We'll all get together first thing in the morning at nine o'clock every day and talk about what are the stories around what relate to our area. So is there a rescue that went on that was somewhere in the news? Maybe it's not even in the UK, but maybe it's in our area. Um, what are the issues that are affecting the charity sector? And then from that, we produce a daily bulletin which goes out to key staff members. And then that is, um, you know, that forms the basis of what, what we do. And th some of those stories will get passed on to other colleagues. So if there's, um, you know, one of us spots something quite interesting happening with the charity sector in terms of tax, that might get passed on to the relevant team for them to look at. So it's a great way of us gathering data, but also of us knowing what each other are working on. We'll talk about what filming's coming up and all that kind of stuff. So we also have a weekly insight title, which is where we look at trends in those areas. So we will look at what are the big trends with housing prices for the moment. How is that going to affect our, um, you know, income we get from supporters? Are they feeling the pinch more or less at the moment? How should we adjust our messages for that? And so that's really interesting. We also have a coastal safety huddle on a Friday, which is where we talk about um, how many drownings there have been this year, whether there's any trends, um, what our coastal safety activity is that feeds into that. Um, and all of these places are really good for us gathering content for social media. I suppose my point is you might not have all of these strands of operation, but actually, are you reaching out to all the different bits of your organisation to get the stories that might be interesting? Because you quite often find there's someone in engineering who actually has created some little gadget that's a world first. That's a great story. It's not necessarily your key marketing message, but you know what? Your followers, your supporters are interested in knowing about that. Your customers and your potential clients will be too. So go out. I suppose my point from that one is go out and find that stuff. And at the morning news huddle, everyone's waiting for this, I'm sure. We do have the animal klaxon. 
No matter what we do, how great the content, if we rescue an animal and it's cute and fluffy and we've got a great photo of it on the board as we bring it back in, that's always going to trump other stuff. You know, it, there's an important point and there's a reason um, for that. We, we'll rescue animals because actually what happens is if we don't, the owner will try and rescue it and get themselves into more trouble. So it's more of a preventative measure than actually we're there to go and um, rescue animals. The one on the, on the uh, right as you look at it, what happened there was a guy who went out kayaking, um, I think it was in Wales, and his dog followed him out and was swimming, but he was unaware the dog was behind him and was getting tired and, and more and more tired. And actually um, someone from the beach spotted it and there was a lifeguard patrolling on his board not far away, so they went and picked up the dog um, and the owner on the beach had been looking for it. Um, Great story, great photo. I, don't, I need to pay someone for that photo, it's fantastic. I don't know which um, member of our team got that. On the, on the other side, you might have heard recently there was a dolphin that got stranded um, up near Chester. So our guys were called. And the guy on the left of the photo there is actually from Marine Conservation Society. So he was there to advise us how best to handle the dolphin. We, are, we do train for that kind of stuff. And the reason we were there is because actually a lot of members of the public were potentially endangering themselves by going in to see the animal, or perhaps scaring it and getting it involved. So, yes, um, we don't actually have an animal klaxon, by the way. We just always joke about it at the morning news huddle. Um, someone will usually make a klaxon noise if there's an animal rescue story. But I think the, the lesson there really is look out for those things because they not, might not necessarily, that key story, that thing that, goes, that gets a really good interest from people, might not actually be the thing you think it is. So analytics and insights. Um, following on from what Andy said, really, I don't know how many, of, how many of you have used Facebook advertising? A couple? And did you use the Advert Manager or did you use Power? Who used Advert Manager and who used the Power Editor? No one. Facebook has two ways you can set adverts. And in the Power Manager, you can actually go to the level of targeting an advert at an individual. Well, normally I thought there'd be a stunned, <gasps> but no, no gasps, okay. Um, I didn't know that until I really delved into it. But actually, when you think about that, that's the perfect coming together of the data-driven stuff and the human interest, the, the what your feelings are. And actually, you can, you can use that advert manager to look at how many people that are our supporters also like kayaking, for example. So you can use it to get some interesting information and target safety messages just at those people. You can target things to really, really small niches. Um, you can't target by person, by the way. You can only target by user ID. But if you've used an app for a competition, it will capture user ID. So you could target an advert at people who've entered one of your competitions, for example. That level of granularity is where data-driven um, advertising and online marketing is going. And I think being aware of that also does raise that risk, personally. You know, how, how much data is there about me out there online? Has anyone ever, who's Googled themselves? OK, who's actually Googled themselves? Come on, who, who's saying they have never Googled themselves? Okay, interesting. Um, there is a scary amount of information out there about you, and there's not, not a great deal we can do about it. But have a think. You know, when, whenever we talk to our staff about being ambassadors or about having a Facebook profile, yeah, we can show them how to lock down their profile, but actually all it takes is one of their friends to take a screenshot and share it with a journalist friend of theirs, and that story's out there. So I, I always work under the assumption that anything you put online is going to be available publicly. And I think that's a safe way to be. But don't worry about it, because there is so much that it, it's just going to... Um, you can't... I think you can't get too hung up on what's out there, because someone would have to want to target you specifically. And I don't think that level of stuff is going on at the moment. But what we are seeing is some great advances, like Google Now, which I use myself quite a lot. Um, although I've recently discovered in the last month... So this is the, uh, the Google phone thing that tells you what you want to know before you go there. On my cards, which is the bits of information it gives you, I've set a few things up. So it'll always tell me the weather where I am and the weather back at home, as well as the clocks. Um, it started telling me where the nearest pub is when I go somewhere. <laughs> I don't know quite how it worked that out because I don't check in at places, but um, it's kind of useful because quite often their recommendations are quite good. I tried a couple of them um, purely for research measures and uh, they were really good. Anyway, when we look at a campaign, um, we do have an insights team that has built quite a detailed picture of who our supporters are. So we've broken it down into five segments of how well engaged they are with us. So are they someone who volunteers, right down to are they someone who might not even have heard of us. We also have six life stages, so we split age groups up. Um, you know, for example, we have settling down, which is people in their 30s, 
who are sort of starting families, um, sharing photos of their kids um, on PowerPoint slides, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, not putting you into a bracket there, sorry. Um, and actually, although we do go by feel, we, we have a feel for how a campaign will work, how we react to people, we do, we do know the kind of words we need to use to approach those people. We do know what their interests are. We do know where they are online. We do know what other charities they support. So we do take that data and spend a lot of time gathering that data to give us a feel for how we market to those people who are engaged with us in a specific way. The next thing I really wanted to come on to um, is just, it's really important that you track what you do online. And I think this gets a bit lost with some social media um, things. People assume that it's kind of quite hard to track, you know, what we do from Facebook and Twitter. And when we talked about the, um, the, uh, the not provided keyword terms, Actually, how do, we, how do we counter that as a business? How do we still track that information? I'm going to come back to that. And it's really important as well that we report and, and analyse that data in a meaningful way. I thought it was really interesting, again, where Andy said the stat of 44%, is that right, of CEOs who feel they get too much data. Part of my job is to take campaigns and to translate the data for different audiences internally. So I might give one set of data to the actual marketing um, colleague who's worked on it. I might give a headline figure that I give some context to, to a head of department. So I might say, you know, this campaign reached this many people, we would expect an average post to reach this many. And I think that's where our job as marketing professionals is going to become increasingly important, is going to be able to make sense of that data. Um, we also need to be really adaptable. I talked a little bit earlier, actually, about immediacy and accuracy. Um, the timing's really difficult for us because we like to plan in all of our jobs. We have design colleagues in-house, and we also use agencies when we have too much demand. But actually, we do have some design time penciled in every week for when we get those ad hoc jobs that come up. Did anyone see Dave the Dolphin, the Twitter account? It was more of a local Chester thing, so you might not have done. So when we, when we were called to rescue that dolphin, someone had set up a parody account for the dolphin on Twitter. And um, so, yeah, the dolphin was tweeting, saying, no, I quite like it in Chester. I don't want to be taken back out to sea. The RNLI are quite horrible. So we were able to slightly bend our um, tone of voice guidelines and talk back to the dolphin and give it a bit of banter. And actually, what happened was the, dolf the dolphin, I say, obviously, it's not really the dolphin. <laughs> I probably should clarify that, but I'm not saying you're stupid and you thought it was the dolphin, but um, the dolphin actually set up a fundraising page for the RNLI. And then he said, uh, you know, if I can raise this much money, perhaps the RNLI will leave me in Chester. And people donated to it. So our being able to act immediately, being monitoring for these things and knowing that we could communicate with it in the right way and that we were given the trust to do that, um, actually meant we raised some money from a fictional dolphin Twitter account. <laughs> I'm quite proud of that. There's not many people that can say they've done that. We also got involved in Harlem Shake. So one of the trainers from the college came to us and said, we'd like to do a Harlem Shake video. Does everyone know what Harlem Shake video is? Yes? Yeah? I'm going to assume yes. It's a silly dancing thing. It starts off quite normal and then it goes a bit crazy. So we had a group of trainers from the college who said, we'd like to do one. Um, is that OK with you? Coming to us, the social media team. And we said, yeah, um, we think it's a great idea. We should run it past our operations department, which is the people who look after all the lifeboats, you know, safety and all that. What happened next was the weirdest chain of emails I've ever had in my life. I had to email some examples of Harlem Shake videos to the executive team. <laughs> I had to explain what it was and why it would be good for us to do it. Um, the next thing I saw was one of our directors, directors, emailing one of the other directors and saying, do we have to, do, do we have to get naked? <laughs> Because one of the videos had someone naked right in the background and I hadn't noticed. Um, there's probably a lesson there about carefully vetting what you send to people. The next thing I knew is the executive team were all on board and it actually turned out that this is on a Friday. On the Monday, they were all going to be in pool. So suddenly it went from being a trainer's thing to being, can we organise this on the Monday and actually have the chief executive and all of the executive team taking part? So then we put a call out to staff and we ended up with about 100 of our staff and volunteers dressed up, doing a Harlem Shake at the college. When we tweeted it out, um, I'd met someone from Macmillan, and they said, oh, I think ours is a better video. And then there was this whole conversation, a bit of banter online. A couple of other charities joined in, and we ended up with a charity shake-off. So what happened was we all asked, we said, we said here are our three videos. We bought a web page, so did Macmillan, um, 
and so did the others. There was a couple of others actually, but that was early on in the campaign, we just put three in. And we said, whoever gets the most text to donate votes is the charity Shake Off winner. We had press attention from all over the world. We raised about 800 pounds, I think. Um, we had over 400 votes. Um, and it was just something that started. We found it, we explored it, and we were able to do that. And I think that was really great. One of the things I've always tried to do when uh, I speak is not just talk about stuff that we do, but actually give you some practical stuff to take away. And I know at the end of the day, you've got some takeaways, so sorry if I'm cutting into that a tiny bit. Um, I want to give you three things that I think are really useful that you can all take away. Um, who here uses Twitter? Who uses Twitter lists? A handful. Twitter lists are the most powerful thing you can spend some time setting up that is absolutely worth your while doing. Twitter lists allow you to follow 800 people but have 20 of them as charity techies. So if you need to know what's going on in that specific sector, you can look in that list and find those tweets. If you had to go back through your timeline and you were following 800 people, you would spend hours going through all of those tweets. I like to surf, um, I like to try and surf, I should say, because Bournemouth's not the most reliable um, for surf conditions. I've found five Twitter accounts that tweet about the surf conditions. So I have a list for surf tweeters. So if I wanted to find those tweets, they would be hidden somewhere within my list. If one of my colleagues comes to me and says, what are our 10 benchmark charity competitors doing on social media at the moment? I have a list for that. I can go and look straight at that list. It gives me the tweets from those organizations. It's a way of creating a subset of the people you follow. You can also put people into lists that you don't follow, and that can be really useful as well from a sort of interesting point of view. If you've never set up a list, I thought I'd grab a couple of screenshots. So if I click on where it says Burnham on Sea, It'll bring up their account. If you click on the little headshot bit, if you like, the sort of outline, you can then add or remove someone from a list. You get this little um, list. This is my lists. You'll notice a couple of them if you've got really keen eyes. So I've got padlocks left next to them. Those are private lists that only I can see. The other lists are public. So anyone could go onto my Twitter account and look at a Luke on live forward slash journalists and you'll find the people I've put in there or RNLI and charity people. You can create a list just by clicking create a list as you go there. That will save you so much time and is so useful if you do weekly or monthly reports. I can't emphasize enough how much, um, when I used to run Twitter workshops, Twitter lists was the thing that people came back time and time again and said that was the most useful thing I learned um, from that session. So go away, set up some Twitter lists, get into the habit of when you follow new people, putting them into lists so you know where they are. And remember, um, it will notify someone that they're in a public list. So if you're going to have a list of idiots I want to keep an eye on, Make it private. <laughs> I hope there's none of them on there. Anyway. So um, the second takeaway was something that uh, I was on a panel uh, last year um, up in London at an event. And um, I'm going to shamelessly steal a great phrase I heard, which was, be honest, is what you're doing digital junk mail? That really floored me. It's such a simple line and so powerful. Think about what you're doing. Does this campaign I'm working on, does it actually help my client? Does it help the audience I've got out there? Does it meet some business need? OK, that's great. But is it digital junk mail? Am I just doing something for the sake of doing something? Or does this actually have a purpose? Is this gaining support for us? Is this raising donations? Does this have an end purpose? And think about what the journey is. OK, I've got lots of people to like my page. What do I want them to do next? We've got a competition running at the moment. What we really want to do is then convert those people to supporters to be more engaged with us. We had a campaign recently where we asked people to donate their social media channels called SaveWave. But actually, we had a whole series of next steps. When people sign up for that, we ask them if they want their email address. Then we'll email them about the campaign. Then at the end of the campaign, we'll say, would you like to support us more ongoing? We've got a journey planned out for all of that activity. And I think that's quite often missing. So have that sense check. Am I doing something? Is it standalone? Does it lead on to another thing? And be honest, is it digital junk mail? And if it is, I don't want it. Track absolutely everything. We are losing data from Google at a rapid rate with secure logged in search as well as um, non-showing keywords. So absolutely every bit of content, in theory, I'll probably miss a couple, that we put out on the RNLI social media channels, we track. We either create a bit.ly tracking link, which allows us to go back in later and look at how many clicks it's had, any other tweets that they've been. I don't know if you know, but if you put a plus on the end of any bit.ly link, you can see all of, all of its analytics. So if you see someone else using a bit.ly link, you can just type that in, put a plus on the end, and see how many people clicked on that link. That's really useful data to know. And also, Google Analytics, um, you can put a campaign, medium, and keyword. What's the third one? 
source, that's it, thank you. Campaign source and medium on the end of a tracking link to show how people have got to that bit of content. So if we're tweeting out a news story, we will add some tracking to that so that we know when we look at Google Analytics for that page, have they come from Twitter, have they come from Facebook? But not only that, which posts have they come from? So when we're looking at a campaign that's longer, every Facebook post about that campaign will have a different tracking link. The campaign will be the same, the source will be the same because it'll be Facebook, but the actual um, medium, <laughs> sorry, will be post and then a date, for example, so that we know which bits of Facebook activity drove traffic to our website. So track everything, be a data tracking nerd. That's my absolute top tip for today. Um, and most importantly, keep a spreadsheet with those links in. Have a common format for setting them up. If you're a bigger organization, if you have Facebook as your campaign with a capital F and a lowercase f, that will show up as two separate campaigns. So you've got to be very strict about who sets them up and how they set them up, being exactly in line with previous ones. So we have a spreadsheet, we track all of that from, so we can go in later on and say, right, here are all the bits of activity. You can find them in Google Analytics and report on them really accurately. That was it, thank you very much.